Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to bring to you today an event on Mr. Jones, the movie. Our hostess, our moderator for the event is Anne Applebaum, a world-renowned historian whose book, The Red Famine, makes her the absolutely perfect moderator for this event. Anne, over to you. Well, good morning if you're in the US and good afternoon if you're in Europe. Um, I'm really, really pleased today to be able to moderate this discussion with Andrea Halupa, who is the scriptwriter for the movie, Mr. Jones, and with Agnieszka Holland, who is the uh, director of, the, of this film. Um, Andrea is a New York-based writer. She's also the host of a podcast called Gaslit Nation. Um, this is a, together with Sarah Kenjor. Um, this, uh, I believe, is her first film, um, but I know she worked on it for many years, and we'll, we'll get into some of what inspired her and why she did it. Um, Agnieszka Holland is really one of Poland's greatest living directors, the winner of multiple prizes at multiple festivals, um, maybe best known to Americans for Europa Europa, but also um, many other movies. Um, before we start our conversation, we're going to see a very short trailer for the film. So this is Mr. Jones. Um, it's a film about that takes place in the 1930s in Soviet Ukraine, and this is th this is a couple of minutes introduction to it. Alio? Paul, I need your help. Arranging an interview with Stalin. Go see Walter Durante at the New York Times. Listen, I really need to talk to you. I found something big. You can break the story wide open. Paul? Mr. Jones. Mr. Durante. So why are you really here? I need your help. This is Ada Brooks. She's my star. What do you want? The story no one is talking about. Ukraine. Stalin's gold. will retract your statements to the press immediately. Or they will shoot our engineers. You actually thought you could interview Stalin and make some kind of difference, didn't you? What is the agenda now? You don't have an agenda, unless you call truth an agenda. Can we now begin our conversation? <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Um, so for those of you just joining, um, that was a clip, uh, that was the introductory clip to the film, Mr. Jones. Um, Mr. Jones is the story of Gareth Jones, who is a, was a Welsh, he was a journalist, but he was more than a journalist, as, as we're gonna discuss in a minute, who uh, visited Stalin's Russia in 1933 to investigate a story that he knew about. Um, and this was the story of the, the famine that Stalin had inflicted on the Ukrainians um, that was at, even at that time when he was there was killing millions of people and, um, and, and he sought to find it and to, and to, and to tell the world the story. Um, it's a very contemporary story because you know, this was the 1930s version of fake news. So there was, Stalin was denying there was a famine. Most of the Moscow press corps wasn't reporting on the famine. Um, yet Jones was um, one of very few people, there were one or two others, but he was one of very few um, who not only dared to tell the story, but also went to Ukraine at the height of the famine. Um, it's quite a difficult story to tell. Um, it takes place in a time that's now unfamiliar to us, um, characters who we don't know. Um, but I, I think it's very, I think the film has been very successful in bringing home um, both the events as they happen and also um, there are clear echoes for some issues in the present time in the movie as well. Um, as I said in my introduction, I, I have here with us um, both the scriptwriter Andrea Halupa and the 
um, director, Agnieszka Holland. Um, Andrea, let me start with you, um, because I know this was the film had, this was your inspiration in many ways. Um, tell me, first of all, what brought you to the story? Um, and then describe for me some of the challenges you faced in trying to write this kind of script. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Um, huge admirer, longtime fan of your work. So this is a big uh, moment for me personally, and I appreciate all that you've done as a historian to, to put light on this. Um, so for me, the story began with my grandfather growing up in Northern California, very far away from Wales. Um, my grandfather, who's from Donbass, Eastern Ukraine, which is now um, being invaded by Russia, uh, my grandfather was the world to me. Um, and I remember you know, getting donuts with him on Saturday, going to the park, and when I got older, I started to understand uh, what my grandfather endured in Ukraine under Stalin, including um, Stalin's genocide famine against Ukrainians. And shortly before he passed away, uh, he wrote down his entire life story. He wasn't a writer, but he felt compelled to leave behind his testimony. And um, so when I got to university, I studied Soviet history, and I was working on a very heavy thesis and in a very different topic. And to procrastinate, I started poking around my grandfather's stories, namely, you know, why did Stalin get away with mass murdering millions of Ukrainians, uh, going in, seizing their grain, selling it abroad to rapidly modernize the state, killing millions of people in the process. And I knew about Walter Duranti, the Moscow bureau chief of the New York Times as a little girl. I mean, and I, and I, was, I was just very um, driven to understand why would a journalist uh, go against the ethics of his profession? And, and being in, at university at the time, the more I dug into Duranti, the more I got pulled into his story. He was really the gateway drug into the film. Uh, Sally Taylor's great book, Stalin's Apologist, um, Duranti's biography talks about these wild satanic sex orgies that Duranti would have in 1920s Paris. He uh, was friends and lovers with the Satanist Aleister Crawley who inspired uh, the Rolling Stones to write Sympathy for the Devil. So of course, as a college student, this was all fascinating. And um, we show a glimpse into this hedonistic uh, lifestyle in Moscow. And even in Moscow, when, when Duranti was there as a, as a social ringleader, he would engage in these vile avant-garde parties that were, were you know, abusive towards some of the locals. There's one horrible story where they, uh, and that Sally Taylor writes about in her book, uh, where they bricked a Russian girl and a Russian boy inside a wall at a party and kept them there all night and they thought that was hilarious. Duranti remarked about how, you know, how entertaining that was. So for me, I just really wanted um, to expose him and to give justice to Gareth Jones and, and, and to force some sort of accountability because this had been, um, uh, this, uh, this was a little known story for so long. And I think one of the challenges was grounding people in the year 1933, which was a crossroads year for humanity. Uh, we, we begin the film, Mr. Jones, when this goofy, um, uh, underestimated politician, Hitler, has just become chancellor of Germany. And at the time, uh, the West is just too tired from the, from the Great War to deal with Stalin. So it was very difficult, I think, um, to give the audience the information they needed, they needed to understand that these two massive asteroids Hitler and Stalin had just hit the earth, but humanity had yet to really catch up to it at this point in the story. Yes, well, I suppose we should back up for the audience who hasn't seen the film a little bit and explain that the main character is Gareth Jones and he's a Welsh journalist who actually interviewed Hitler um, and who also talked his way basically into Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, Walter Duranti was at that time the New York Times correspondent in Moscow. Um, and the one of the great you know, one of the most fascinating stories really of that era is the kind of tension and competition between the two of them, because Gareth Jones was the truth teller. Um, he wanted to tell the truth about the Soviet Union, and Duranti was the one who covered it up. And so very, very carefully and systematically, actually, Duranti went out of his way not to tell the story of the famine. Um, and even when Jones's material finally came out, um, he, he bent over backwards to dismiss it. He kind of patronizingly wrote about Jones and said, 
well, this clever young man, you know, speaks a bit of Russian, but he doesn't really understand this country. Um, and there is a there are some deeper mysteries there, which is why this happened. You know, what what was Durante's motivation? Um, and in in your film, you you portray both of them. You know, um, and 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 the clash between the two of them. Um, and some of the there's a kind of argument about Durante being corrupt and decadent and so on. Um, but one could also say um, this is a story about the whole Moscow press corps at that time. No, so so why wasn't Stalin's story? Why wasn't the, the true story? of what was happening in Ukraine being told? Well, I think it's the same uh, tensions and pressures that journalists are under today even. Um, being a journalist back then, like today, was uh, a very insecure profession. It's a, it's a socially uh, dependent profession. You, you, writers are very much dependent on their relationships with editors. So as a result, you have a lot of uh, conformity you have a lot of reluctance to really go out on a limb because you could lose your livelihood. So reporting on the famine or, or doing any dangerous work uh, as a journalist in 1930s Moscow would get you kicked out of the country and you could risk losing your job. So one of the challenges in making the film was I got drawn in to this dynamic world of, of leading credible journalists that were the window for the rest of the world into what was what was going on in the Soviet Union during this this very exciting time when the world was turning to uh, Stalin as as a beacon of hope. You had the Great Depression ravaging uh, the rest of the world, and so people were really looking at the workers' utopia as as a solution uh, to what what to all the world's troubles of, of you know stabilizing things and, and building a better future. And so these journalists, these Western reporters, carried a lot of clout. They had a lot of power. And uh, when, you, when you dig into the research, it was incredible that this famine was raging uh, r right under their noses. They knew what was going on, but they refused to talk about it. They refused to touch it. And Gareth, being an outsider, being young, not being a traditional journalist, he, he had a, a number of different interesting jobs. He was a total outsider. He was like this cowboy that came into town and blew the lid off this thing and, and very much broke up the, the uh, party. He made uh, their existence in Moscow go from being decadent and indulgent um, to uncomfortable. And so gradually these guys started to leave town, including Durante. Right. Um, I should say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now ask a couple of questions of Agnieszka Holland. To those who are watching, if you wanna ask questions either to Andrea or to Agnieszka Holland, um, there's a Q&A function that you should see at the bottom of your screen and please type in your questions and little in the second half of the program, I will, um, I will read some of them aloud. aloud. Now, another aspect of the film that people should understand is that there's a, there's a very difficult series of scenes um, when, because Gareth Jones did eventually get to Ukraine. Um, the way he did this was by getting an invitation. He secured an invitation to go and visit a factory um, in Kharkiv in, in, in Ukraine, and he, he took a train from Moscow. Um, about halfway there, um, he got off the train and started walking down the train tracks. Um, and he did this, this was in March, 1933. And so it really was actually at the height of the famine. Um, the famine had begun um, essentially the previous win fall and winter when um, mo much of what the Ukrainian peasants had in their houses, not just grain actually, but all kinds of food, you know, beans and peas and meat and livestock and all kind everything that they had in their storage was literally taken away from them. So this was not a famine that was caused by drought. It wasn't caused by some accident of nature. It had been caused deliberately um, by Stalin um, for a variety of reasons we can talk about. Um, one was to get the grain and to sell it abroad. Um, another reason was to tamp down rebellions that he feared were coming from 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 Ukraine, and it was it was a kind of political punishment for the Ukrainian peasants whose whose um, whose rebelliousness he was always had always been afraid of. Um, but get, but Jones got off the train and he started walking down the train tracks through these Ukrainian villages um, at, at a moment when people were really starving to death. And the in a way the emotional height of the film is when Jones gets off the train and enters Ukraine. And there's a very striking series of scenes that take place in starving Ukraine. And Agnieszka Holland, um, I wonder if you could talk about the decisions you made about filming those. Um, there's a scene with children's, you know, where, where their children, um, you know, star, who seem to be eating human flesh. There are scenes where 
um, you know, Jones is running away from, from peasants. Can you describe to me how you thought about making, this is a very difficult kind of theme to film. What was the thought process you went through? What kinds of directorial decisions did you have to make in order to do this? Well, um, good morning or good afternoon. And um, I'm really thrilled um, um, that I have the occasion to talk to you through this Zoom <laughs> mean. Um, I, I have to tell that my first reaction when um, Andrea sent me the script was uh, a priori negative. It means um, I did three movies um, um, concerning uh, Holocaust and I spent, I count one day, that I spent about seven years, uh, even a little more of my lifetime in the Holocaust somehow. And I knew that it is even, even you know, when I was only the reporter of the of the of this uh, fact uh, and this experience that is very painful and is very difficult and is um, a huge responsibility when you are telling the story like that uh, and because those movies has been somehow um, somehow successful three of them received um, the oscar nomination uh, I, I i didn't stop to receive the scripts about the human um, tragedies and historical tragedies um, Holocaust, uh, Armenian genocide, um, uh, Rwanda, Kampucha, and so on. So when the script about uh, Ukrainian famine, Stalin's famine, came um, on my table, my first reaction was, I, I, I cannot, I, I cannot <laughs> tell it anymore. And then, then I started to think. It means I started to think before even there is something incredibly unjust. Uh, in the fact that the, the Stalin's crimes and communist crimes altogether didn't enter the global conscience, that the, uh, as much as the Nazi crimes are the part of the of the of the of the memory of the of the humanity, uh, communist crimes um, vanished somehow. Uh, they, uh, even with such a great uh, books like uh, Solzhenitsyn and. and um, your Gulag and um, Timothy Snyder's Bloodland, uh, Bloodland and, uh, and others, uh, it, it was like forgotten and forgiven. And um, I, um, I, find, I find it very unjust and also dangerous, unjust uh, because those victims uh, remained nameless and voiceless and um, dangerous because it means that we cannot um, learn the lesson which always comes from these dark moments of the of the of the history of the humanity, and that um, in the present and in the future, uh, the form of that can come back without any kind of the warning. So I was thinking that because the film series and this audiovisual narration is um, is very powerful um, a powerful uh, tool to. Uh, to wake up the 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 the, the humans' uh, emotions and empathy, uh, I thought there is some kind of the duty to to tell those stories. Uh, another reason it was the relevance of the story and what you've been talking um, about the, the the role of the media, so of the journalists, the fake news propaganda, the polarization of the of the societies, which uh, means also the polarizations um, of of media and so on. Uh, after after doing uh, those few films about Holocaust, I, I knew how how terrible difficult it is to show the um, horrors. And um, when when I decided to tell the story of, of uh, Garrett Jones and Ukrainian famine, um, I started to think also how I can find the language and images, imaginary, how to tell the story, which somehow is similar to the ghettos or concentration camps when the people also have been starving from hunger, but in the same time it's different. There's something different about it, something very different about it. And I knew that if I will not grab the truth, like also some kind of artistic truth, um, the, the movie will not work. That, that is the heart of the, of, of the story. And we started by, by that. We, we, our first shooting day was uh, in minus, um, minus 15, 20 degrees of Celsius. In the Ukraine, with very deep snow, which we didn't expect, because it was beginning of March, and with the global warming, normally it was never like that. It just came for us, I think. Um, and um, 
And um, I was thinking that uh, dying of, of, of hunger in such a circumstance is your house, or it, it, it means silence, loneliness, emptiness. Uh, you don't see blood, uh, you don't uh, hear uh, cries or shouts. Every is silent and distant somehow. Um, so we decided to, to, to do it in a very minimalistic way. To, uh, the colors went practically to black and um, white, not completely, but it's saturated. And it happened also because of the snow and because of the, of the, of the um, older wooden houses, which mean, which mean the Ukrainian house, um, country houses um, in this time. Uh, and um, this, um, this silence means also that the people have been dying voiceless. What stri struck me the most when I read several, uh, several um, articles and books uh, about the famine is uh, that the historians are till now arguing um, how many victims there have been. Uh, and the, the, the range is between three and a half and eight and a half, nine millions. It means it's the gap of five millions. It's incredible that, that the gap can be like that, that we don't know the names of that, that our data have been erased, that, that it's very, very, very little of the, of the, of the documents, uh, not graves. You, you know, I, and, and, and silence after, which followed after, because it was, it was forbidden to speak about it, and it was dangerous that people, when talking about the famine, had been, been arrested and sent to, uh, to gulags. So I try to, to express those feelings I, I, I had when I was imagining um, this experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I've been to a memorial for the victims of the famine um, that was a couple of hours outside of Kiev. And one of the striking things about it was in one village was there was a, exactly as you say, there was a list of names, but there was also kind of just surnames. And then it would say plus three children, you know, or the, you know, the, the something family, you know, so there were, there were some idea of how many people died, but, you know, it was unspecific. There were no names and so on. So yes, there was this, um, this, this tremendous um, silence. Um, well, before you came on, Andrea and I were talking about the difficulties of portraying this era, you know, is that the year 1933 is one that is somehow lost to us. I mean, we think of it as the year Hitler came to power, um, but it's also the year of the Ukrainian famine. It's also the year um, of the beginning of what eventually became the, the, the purges and so on in the Soviet Union. Um, I, Agnieszka, when you were when you were thinking about um, Moscow and how to show what people looked like and acted like there, um, what sources did you draw on? Who were you thinking about when you were when you were making those scenes of the of the city and of the way that people interacted there? Well, several books, but also somehow you know the Moscow I've seen when I was a teenager. I visited when I was seventeen, uh, and um, thirty years later. Uh, and um, it's something, um, and uh, and also um, somehow cabaret the movie uh, by um, Bob Falls. It means it was the time, it was the time um, when this kind of the you know of the um, of the behavior, this feeling that um, this titanical feeling, and at the same time this um, incredible vital energy, uh, I think was palpable, but. Um, uh, the contrast. When I, I was interested in the contrast between this uh, this uh, lushness of of of, um, of these orgies uh, uh, and um, and um, and uh, and uh, and uh, poorness of the ordinary people and um, and um, and then um, of the Ukraine, which was uh, which was um, locked in the in the in the hunger and death. So. Um, it was a lot of images, a lot of photos, a lot of, 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 of movies, a lot of books. But somehow I had impression, mostly when I'm doing historical movies, I don't feel that the past is dead. And I even feel that the past is not really the past. Uh, I have impression that, um, that I evoke something which I lived in. Uh, so I try to be as sensual and as, um, 
as contemporary somehow, as, or, or, as present as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the Moscow was, was the city of, of the contrast because it was, uh, uh, but what was really for me interesting, it was um, how attractive it was for those guys coming from, uh, from, the, from the West. Uh, with different motivations. We have the, the fictional character in the movie, Ada Brooks, with the compilation of several characters, and, uh, and, um, and she's a sympathetic character, and, uh, but she supports Stalin, and she thinks that what he's doing is so great that um, we, can, uh, we, can, uh, we can understand the sacrifices and that the alternative uh, is um, the fascism and Hitler, uh, and the communists, it is a radiant future for her. And this, this, this approach, this idealistic approach um, was common in this time and it is understandable when we, when we know that it happened after the uh, um, bloody First World War, which was a disaster for the entire generation in Europe. And after pandemic of Spanish flu, which, uh, which costed even more victims than the First World War, and, uh, and during the economical crisis. So it looked that the capitalism and the, and the, and the, and the traditional kind of the liberal democracy or whatever it was in this time, before the First World War, uh, is, uh, is dangerous and, 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 and corrupted. So, um, so those people wanted to believe in, in, in the different way. And, um, and Soviet Union uh, seemed to be the different way. But what, sur what surprised me coming as an immigrant um, uh, to France in 1982 uh, during the martial law in Poland, it was that this, um, that this kind of the, of the belief in Soviet Union, after, even after uh, Khrushchev's um, uh, 20s in, in Congress, even after all the revelations, even after Budapest in 56, um, Prague in 68, um, Poland uh, uh, in many years, and so on, that this belief that is something wonderful in this, uh, in this, in this, um, in, this uh, in this program, in this project, reminded, it. and that is why I think one of the deep reasons why the public, Western public opinion, never accepted deeply accepted the truth about the uh, real nature of um, of the uh, soviet regime yeah that's that's of course a fascinating question i've written about it as well i mean i think it's always been a problem for the west um to accept you know that we defeated hitler which was our great victory you know victory over 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 evil and good over evil it's always been hard for us to accept that we did that um in alliance with another evil system you know in alliance with mm. the soviet union which was also evil because it somehow undermines um, our own achievement. Um, Andrea, I'm going to start asking some of the some of the questioners. I'm beginning to see um, on the list. Some of them are actually echoing things I'd like to ask you myself, and they concern the psychology of both Gareth Jones um, and Walter Duranty. Because this again, so again, for people who haven't seen the film, this is one of the key points of the film. There's one journalist who wants to tell the truth and one who wants to conceal it. And so the question is what motivated them. Um, and Greg asks, I don't have his surname, um, whether Durante was a slavish follower of Stalin because he was secretly a communist and believed in the ideology, or just because he enjoyed the status he had in the USSR. Um, and one could ask a similar question about Jones. What motivated him? What drove him? You know, why did he leave, you know, what is effectively rural Wales? He was from Aberystwyth. What let, why did he leave there and, and, and travel all the way to Moscow? Yeah, so I think for Durante's motivation, I think Durante was was uh, aligned on the side of power. He wanted power. And I don't think it was, you know, this was very fashionable at the time to be a supporter of Stalin and the great Soviet experiment. And Durante had this sort of um, strange, complex personality, being a very dark, complicated person that he could thrive in a far off post, in an exotic location of Stalin's Moscow. He was the king of, of, of that expat social life um, because of his larger than life personality. And he enjoyed that celebrity. He enjoyed that power. 
I think ultimately he, he wanted to be a celebrity. It was just a classic story of access journalism and a, a classic story of journalists um, not doing their duty because they were more enamored with their proximity to power. And in exchange for that, Geronti got to be a uh, interesting uh, figure every time he went to New York City. He would go to the Algonquin Round Table. Um, there was, um, he met with FDR when FDR was running for president and FDR called it the, the most interesting meeting, you know, one of the most interesting meetings he ever had. Uh, so I think when, you know, when Peter Sarsgaard and I were sitting down to really geek out over all the research into Durante, that's really what the focus was, that Durante just chose the life of celebrity and to have the life of celebrity as a journalist, you're essentially um, committing a great act of, of access journalism. So you can be next to power and, and, and have that power radiate off you and, and have that um, influence. Uh, so for instance, after the famine happens, after millions are killed uh, deliberately, what happened? Thanks to Durante's help, you have the U.S. acknowledging for the first time the Soviet Union, giving rec official recognition to the Soviet Union. And Durante actually accompanied the Soviets on the trip to Washington, D.C. to formalize um, that uh, to formalize diplomatic ties with the U.S. And so I, he just he just loved that life. And um, so he sold his soul, essentially. There, there's really no mystery there. And the more uh, that we dug into who Durante was as a person looking for redeeming qualities, I think Peter Sarsgaard's portrayal of Durante is actually quite generous because in the film, we, we gave Durante, you know, we put Durante's son there <laughs> because he had a son with his uh, live-in maid slash lover. But in real life, Durante abandoned his son and and his son's mother. He left them behind. He you know he had he didn't care. He just used them and then moved on to the next chapter and then lived out his life to a ripe old age in Florida, uh, doing you know publishing some things to try to defend himself uh, for the sake of history. Um, but I think at the time when all of this was going on before Twitter, before you know social media could could expose someone like that, I think Durante really thought that he could get away with with what he was doing. And um, so for in Garrett's case, again, it's the same thing. The more I dug into who this person was, the more I kept seeing again and again, Garrett was just a good soul. It's just that simple. Uh, he came from an upstanding family in Wales. Uh, his father was the head of a school, which turned out a lot of graduates that would go on to Cambridge University. And his mother was ahead of her time. She was a governess working for uh, the, the, the big Welsh steel magnate, Hughes, in, in uh, what is currently Donetsk. And so she lived out in, in Ukraine, which uh, as a young woman, which was you know very brave of her. So Gareth, of course, grew up with her stories of adventure and was and felt an affection to Ukraine, even as a child, certainly. And that's what kept drawing him over to that part of the world. He in, in um, historically, Gareth went to the Soviet Union three times, but obviously for the sake of uh, efficiency for telling this tale, we we made this his first big trip to really open his eyes to it. So we subjectively experienced this through him. But so I think, um, I think Gareth was just a young man that was raised right and had a good head on his shoulders and wanted to do what was right. And he was, and he just had such a, um, a nonconformist, stubborn, independent mind. And that's ultimately um, what um, led him into danger and, and um, likely got him killed with that, you know, very risky reporting trip he took uh, um, as a young man into inner Mongolia. So um, so again, just both both Durante and Gareth Jones, the more you dig into them, you know, the, the more good you see on Gareth's side and the more rotten you see on Durante's side. And I think to balance out this story of good and evil, we needed to show our Gareth Jones as a bit naive and in a bit of a, a you know, just taking these, these risks that seem almost self-destructive. And then on Durante's side, we had to show um, a, a, a father to try to humanize him. But the real historical... A Durante was a monster. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, for those who don't know, I, so I wrote a book about the Stalin's war on Ukraine, about the Ukrainian famine. And one of the details I uncovered was the, a description of a dinner that was given in New York um, at the time of the American recognition of the Soviet Union, the official diplomatic recognition. And at the end of the dinner, there was a standing ovation for Walter Durante. So we're talking about somebody who was really a famous journalist in his own time, um, very, very well known. Um, figure. Um, Gareth Jones, I always also, I've, I've found intriguing. I've met some of his family and 
um, over the years. You know, in some ways, he was just also a kind of adventurer. I mean, he was very young. He was in his 20s at the time. He was sort of a journalist, but also someone who was just trying to get into places because he was interested. Um, and that's, I think, you, I think you show that actually very well in the film. Um, there are several questions here um, that, are, that are directed at both of you. Let me take this one. Um, this is a question about Orwell, because Orwell is in the film as well. And of course, in real life, Orwell and Gareth Jones did not know each other. Um, so there's a question about why he's included in the story. And maybe I'll direct this first at Agnieszka Holland. Um, you know, how did, how did you incorporate Orwell into the movie? What did you, um, did, did you have any difficulties doing that? As I said, given that this is a, this is a kind of fictional aspect of the story. That is a bit controversial decision because some people find it unnecessary and I love it. It means it was one of the, of the reason why I started to imagine the film and connecting this, you know, this, um, metaphorical um, dysto Aurelian dystopia of Animal Farm uh, and the story of the famine and the story of, of Garrett Jones, uh, Mr. Jones, um, uh, like the hero of, um, of Animal Farm was named um, as well. Uh, it, um, it put for me the, 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 the narration on different, more exactly more metaphorical level. Uh, and um, and also um, allowed us to make some elliptic narration because it's short pieces of you know Orwell um, uh, Orwell writing Animal Farm helped um, helped us to push the story forward in different way if we um, been following the the, the linear um, um, narration uh, and I'm not sure if they didn't meet actually you know when when we've been analyzing their lives and situations and. It appeared very possible, credible, uh, and I was even sure somehow that they have to meet. Um, uh, they've been less or more of the same age. Um, in the film, always older is just because we, we we love this actor who is older. Uh, but in reality, they've been uh, they've been in similar age. They've been uh, interested in very similar things, in living in the same literary circle and journalistic circle of London, and and sharing the same literary age. And so, the world was it was the world which was quite small. And the Garrett's experience in, in Ukraine and his um, article became became somehow you know famous in in this circle. So. Yeah, I thought it, it, it is good to have him here. And what was interesting for me in, in this opportunity to show that even Orwell, with his um, um, incredible intellectual honesty, he didn't he had he didn't want to accept it really. He wanted to find the excuse uh, for Stalin to to show exactly how powerful uh, this um, this blackmail of the you know of the radiant future was. Um, so, and and about Garrett, we don't we know as as you know Anne as well because you've been talking to the family and reading everything even more certainly than I did. Uh, we we know very few things about him. He it was a young man. When he went to 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 Ukraine, he was twenty seven. When he was killed in 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 China, he was um, uh, he was thirty only, uh, and um, he didn't have like. The close um, family, wife or girlfriend, or or the friends who've been writing about him. So somehow we know what he did. Uh, we know what kind of the of the of the of the persona he had. That the curious, and we 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 just created him a little from the pieces, from the you know puzzles which are not complete at all. Um, uh, I I told to myself um, that. The, the goodness or courage or generosity, that is a real mystery. And I, I had in my movies several characters uh, which been like that. I, I call it that they had the gene of courage or, or gene of justice. And we don't know exactly why. Why everybody ac accepted the conformism and suddenly one young man says, no, the truth is more important and I'm the messenger for those people. Um, but I, we wanted to, to show them on the beginning, it was the curiosity, 
and ambition which which um, which led him to this uh, to this adventure and that on the beginning it was the investigation and the adventurous investigation and only after it became his mission and um, and only after he became the kind of the messenger or signalist um, a bit like um, uh, Polish hero Jan Karski um, during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are a number of questions here about um, Walter Duranty's Pulitzer Prize. Um, and famously, there's been a campaign to try to get the Pulitzer Committee um, to take it away from him. And I, I, can, I can answer a little bit of that question, then I want to ask Andrea about it. Andrea about it. Um, you know, because I was actually a, an expert who was asked to submit some material to the Pulitzer Committee at the time when they were first considering this. And the amusing answer, partly amusing, is they decided not to take it away, partly because they they went back and looked at who else had won the Pulitzer Prize over, you know, the hundred or so years that it's been given out. And there were so many other awful people that they thought, you know, if we start here, will never stop. So, um, so unfortunately, that, that was actually the real reason why um, the committee decided not to do it. Of course, they may they may um, change their minds um, again. But Andre, I wonder if you would you would comment on that because that seems to me the um, there's really a deeper question underlying that, which is the question of reputations, um, the reputation of Gareth Jones, which you know, as, as Agnieszka Holland has just said, I mean, he was a known figure in his time, but he died very young. He was murdered actually under quite strange circumstances in China um, about three years after he came, went, came back from Ukraine. Um, and his name sort of disappeared. Whereas Durante, as we've already said, was feted and famous and so on. Um, and yet here we are kind of 80 years later um, and their, their, their reputations have reversed. And Durante is someone who people campaigned to take his prizes away. Whereas Gareth Jones, there's even a kind of little mini cult around him in Wales. There are exhibitions about him and there's a plaque in his name at his university and so on. Um, and, you know, you've just made a, a, you know, an excellent feature length film about him. Um, was this your intention when, when writing about them both? Was it, was, are you interested in this question of how, how people's reputations change over time? Yeah, ultimately, I made the film for accountability to give some justice to the story and um, and also hold it up as a warning uh, that people have to really, uh, especially people in positions of power. And I consider journalists at the New York Times, at the Washington Post and, and any uh, big platform with a, with a big audience as being in a position of power. And anyone in a position of power anywhere has to uh, really feel the weight of history on them and understand that they have to make decisions that will be examined and, and, and for many years after they're gone. And I, and I just wanted to basically emphasize that for all of us right now, that, that, we, that when you live um, in interesting times, the weight of history, the eyes of history are, are always on you and you cannot escape the judgment of history and it's ultimately. And so um, I think in terms of the Pulitzer question, it's so interesting that you said that, Anne, because it reminds me of um, a meeting recently in London when the film was being released there. Um, so, you know, somebody connected to the British government said, um, you know, there was reluctance in Great Britain to acknowledge uh, the Holodomor as a genocide because if, they acknowledge, if, if Great Britain acknowledged this genocide, then they might be pressed to acknowledge more genocides and that, that the British government helped contributed to and that could lead to reparations and that the British government have to pay out. And so I think we are living in this really interesting age now with, with Confederate statues coming down in the US finally and Stalin statues going up in Putin's Russia. And there is really this, is this history as battleground for accountability and determining what kind of uh, future we wanna live in. You know, either a, a make Russia great again future under Putin um, or, you know, a, a human rights um, confronting our history, healing from our history in the United States. And, and these conversations are so important for us to confront today if we want to move forward. Um, I think um, a nation that knows its, its past protects its future. I think uh, Germany is a leader of the free world because they have done a good job in confronting their own dark history. And I think Russia and the U.S. are both, both hurting themselves by not um, adequately confronting and healing from their, uh, their dark chapters of history. And I think the only way forward is to really bring all these, these stories to light 
um, understand what they mean. Um, and and it's, it's a very healing process. It's a very healing process. Um, I, I was I was overwhelmed by the response to this film in Ukraine, seeing uh, families taking their children to see the film and the messages I was receiving from friends in Ukraine. It, it was a it was a very healing process for people to watch this movie. Uh, it gives back dignity to uh, the victims and the, the descendants of the victims. And, and just to just to say your lives matter and bearing witness matters. Right. No, thank you. There are actually several questions about the reaction to the film in Ukraine and also some questions about how much Ukrainians know about the story. And actually, I think the answer to that is right now it's a lot. I mean, it's a it's a it's part of Ukrainian popular culture. This the story of the famine and even the story of Gareth Jones are 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 understood pretty well. There are also some questions about um, reactions from Russia. Um, and I wondered actually, strangely, if I could direct that first at Agnieszka Holland and then maybe at you, Andrea. Um, do you do you think about how Russians will watch this or how? Um, yes, you know, but uh, take uh, into uh, mm, Go on. Sorry. Um, but uh, Russia didn't buy the film, and when we premiered the film um, in, in at Berlin uh, Film Festival um, over a year ago, the only really hostile reaction came from the uh, Russian uh, journalists and uh, film critics present at the festival, and um, they consider that it's a lie, that we are not telling truth, and that the um, history was different, and that is exaggeration, and the famine was just a famine, and Stalin had nothing to do with that, and so on. So they've been, um, and of course, um, uh, no distributor um, bought the film for the uh, for this uh, Russian distribution. Um, and it didn't surprise me. I, I you know, I, I have a lot of um, Russian friends, and of course, my Russian friends know the history uh, pretty well, and are fighting um, for the truth about this history. Uh, but the most of Russians are educated in in certain way, and uh, they just don't know. Which was um, interesting when I was showing film in U uh, in uh, Israel uh, during the Haifa Film Festival. It premiered, and um, the, it was uh, the great Q and A after very long. I, I think it took uh, like three hours or so, and uh, a lot of the um, audience was um, Russian Jews, uh, and uh, for them emigrated from Russia sometimes many, many years um, um, earlier, it was a shock. They, they didn't know uh, the truth about the famine. They didn't, it means they've been also the victims of this, um, of this um, 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 propaganda education, um, uh, which they had in the, in the, in the Russian um, schools and, uh, and medias. So, you know, it, it, the lies, it's the layers of lies, layers and layers. We can make the ge 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 geology of lies somehow in those countries. And uh, nothing is less true than the history in, in, in those countries. Unfortunately, not only in, in, in Russia, but also in, in, in other post-communist countries, it's very easy to manipulate, uh, to manipulate the truth. Um, so, uh, but um, I, I, I want to tell also that um, on Ukraine, the reception was very emotional and even young people, when, we, when they, I've been talking to the young people or the young actors, when I try to, to, to cast some actors from the episodes and immediately they've been crying. It, it, it is, you, you see that it's not only the part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the history, that it's not the part of the culture, but it is also the non-spoken trauma somehow, non-evacuated trauma for many, many people when the mix of the, of the shame and fear uh, and humiliation uh, are engraved so deeply that um, without um, any kind of the, you know, of the, of the therapy uh, for, 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 for all this time, uh, that the people are extremely affected, but the, the, the famine has still very, very deep effects also on the demography. Because when we see the um, provoked by Putin um, war in Donbas in the in the east um, Ukraine, it is possible also that most of the uh, famine victims been from this region, uh, because Ukraine before between uh, before the Second World War was divided 
western part was um, in Poland and the um, eastern part and the center was with the Soviet Union. And most of the victims have been on, in, in the east. So um, the villages have been and, and, and little towns been empty after the famine. And they've been populated by the, by the Russian migrants. Stalin populated them with, with Russians. So uh, the habitants, today's habitants um, of, of Donbass are in the big part uh, the 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 hairs of um, of Russians migrant migrants and now the um, um, local Ukrainians and uh, it makes this uh, this um, political situation uh, even more uh, complicated and tragic. Yeah, yeah. I would make a little correction to that, which is that the the largest the, the hardest hit areas by the famine were actually parts of Ukraine that are not normally famine prone, which is Kiev and Kharkiv provinces, which is really in central Ukraine. Um, and you're right about Russian immigration into Eastern Ukraine, although some of that also happened later on. It happened really over, you know, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, mm. um, and onward. But but in, in principle, you're right. Um, there's time for, I think, what, just maybe one or two more questions. Um, because one, the great nephew of Gareth Jones has written in, so I feel that he would be allowed to ask a question. And he points out that Jones um, was, a, was, was a postgraduate at Cambridge, and he was followed right afterwards by the very famous Cambridge Five spies, Burgess, McLean, Philby, Blunt, and Cairn Cross, who were British traders who worked with the Soviet Union. Um, and they were deep believers in Soviet communism. And, the, and um, Graham Colley asks whether you can say something about the pressures from the intellectual establishment not to criticize the Soviet Union at the time. And there is a hint of that in the movie, actually, particularly when you show um, Gareth's relationship to his mentor, um, Lloyd George, who, who when he learned that Jones was, you know, causing trouble in the Soviet Union, tried to distance himself from him. Perhaps, Andrea, you'd like to talk about that. Yeah, and I, th I think that's also where the George Orwell connection comes in. Um, so Orwell, when he wrote Animal Farm, uh, he also wrote a preface called The Freedom of the Press, which addresses exactly that, talking about how in the West, there was all this self-censorship where you couldn't touch the Soviet Union. You couldn't talk about how evil the Soviet Union, you couldn't say anything critical of the Soviet Union. There was a whole thought police, Orwell was explaining in this essay, that protected the Soviet Union. And it was uh, very much driven by young communist uh, media, uh, like the, the Daily Worker. Now, keeping in mind, Orwell was a socialist. He believed in. Um, he wrote Animal Farm to try to save, um, uh, uh, try to try to save the movement essentially, and say, and trying to divorce it from Stalin, and, and wanting it to be independent uh, uh, and truly stand for human rights. And he felt that um, Stalin ruined it and really compromised uh, the the movement for socialism. And I and. And I think he was right in a lot of ways because you had all these useful idiots on the left that flourished and uh, were morally compromised with by their um, by turning a blind eye to Soviet atrocities, which continued for the, for decades to come. And um, so I I think uh, there was just this thought police world that we're entering into. And um, if anything, you know, when you ask why is Orwell in the script. People should read why Orwell is in the script um, to understand um, the immense amount of pressure and conformity, the self-censorship, what you know, what was just not okay to even utter as, as, as a journalist, as a writer. Um, just it was just immense. And and I think all of that you can find by by looking up Orwell's essay, The Freedom of the Press, uh, which was not allowed to be the preface for Animal Farm because his publisher thought it might be controversial. Right. Agnieszka Holland, would you like to answer that question? Uh, the question, uh, which question about, um, uh, I don't know exactly what the question was. Well, let me, let me move on. I was, yeah. was going to ask you about intellectual pressure on, oh, yes, on yes. Jones, yeah, because I have, you, it's I have in the film. That, yeah. yeah, I have impression that we talked about that. I did talk about it a bit. It's not mm -hmm. only intellectual, it's also political and economical um, oppression. And then uh, we see it in, you know, it's something we see in our days as well, you know. So um, uh, what was interesting for me and the most relevant is the, the question about the role of the media and the journalism and what it means to be a journalist. And here the, 
the I think that um, Gareth Jones is the kind of hero we need in our days. Um, because um, we are um, again living in the era when the um, public opinion and the, the politics and, and societies are so polarized, then uh, the media are serving one truth. And this kind of the uh, investigative, objective um, uh, journalists which reports, uh, investigate report and report the facts uh, is uh, disappearing, especially that um, uh, that it's uh, that the social media um, and internet created here um, the kind of the of the of the vacuum which is uh, sucking uh, sucking the, the 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 truth and the the patience from the uh, from the readers. So um, the manipulation and use of the fake news became even even more efficient and 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 fast that it was in thirties when Goebbels became such a master and Stalin became such a master of this kind of the of the manipulation and the propaganda and the jury and always found the, the, the journalists which been ready for different reasons or the corruption or the belief uh, to serve um, this agenda or another agenda. Uh, and I believe deeply that um, if this investigative, objective, honest um, journalism uh, dis will disappear, if the corruption of the media became global, uh, the democracy cannot survive. And when the three things um, um, meet, meet together, it means the corruption of the media and cowardice and the opportunism of the uh, political class and the indifference of the people, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. Right, so thank you very much. We're, we've run out of time. There were quite a lot of questions that were specifically about the Ukrainian famine. I answer some of them in my book, um, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. Um, some of them are answered in the film, so please go see it. And I will give the final word to Ambassador Herbst. I'd like to thank our triple A's, Andrea, Agnieszka, and Anne for a substantively and ethically strong presentation. And I'd like to thank our partners at the Temerity Contemporary Ukraine Program for helping us sponsor this event. And I'd like to thank Canadian philanthropist Jim Timothy for having backed this film, which is a very, very important entry into global discourse on this very important subject, which has not received enough attention. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Anne.